his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Now we're going to talk about that be pitiful here in a moment. It's not what you think. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord are against them that do evil. Let's pray this morning. Father, we're thankful for your word today. Thankful that it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And oh, how desperately we need the Word of God. In a day when it seems like everything goes, anything goes, uh, we understand that your Word has disciplines for us. Uh, when, it, when we live in a time when it seems like uh, people say, do whatever you want to do, we know that there is an outline. Uh, there is a blueprint in the way that we should live our life, and it's called the Word of God. Uh, and we look to the Word of God today once again for instruction. Uh, that we may be submitted to the work and the will of God, uh, that we may be disciplined disciples of God, uh, that we may love our brethren, dear Lord, and, and be walking one in, with another, Lord, in one accord. Uh, and I ask you to anoint me to deliver what you've placed in our hands this morning and in our heart. Uh, and I pray that each heart would receive it today and we'll be careful to praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. When Peter was writing this letter, it, when he got to this part of the letter, he was preparing the Christians of his time for a fiery trial that they was about to face. They were already scattered abroad, and we, we've talked about that, how they were scattered and how they were there. He said, but uh, he was encouraging them with this, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse, and uh, what encouragement that is when we, we receive a letter, when we know that we're already there. So I just want to give you some encouragement. It's going to get worse. Uh, you're going to face some tri fiery trials, uh, and, and we're going to talk about that later in the month uh, and maybe into the month of December there in chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, the sufferings that they had to go through and the sufferings that we'll have to go through. Uh, but he says as you're preparing for that, uh, there's going to be a fiery trial of persecutions that, uh, that approach it, but... Uh, he approached it with optimism. Yeah. He approached it with a positive message. Uh, and this is the message that he gave to him. He said, in that, prepare for the best. Prepare for the best. So we're not preparing for the worst. Uh, we know that evil days are coming. We know that persecution, that all that live godly is going to suffer persecution. Uh, but he said there has to be that optimistic approach. There has to be a preparation for it. You've got to prepare for the trial. You've got to prepare uh, for the hardships. You've got to prepare uh, for times of famine. You've got to prepare for times of struggle. Uh, but you do not do it by going in already defeated before it ever starts. Uh, he said the way that you prepare for it uh, is you go in preparing for the best. Uh, so that's the message that he gave them in this section of Scripture, uh, uh, First Peter. Uh, he is telling them and giving them instructions to follow uh, if they would experience the best, uh, uh, that they would have these blessings in the worst of times. Uh, so we look there in the first two verses, 8 and 9. He said, Finally, be uh, ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, uh, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, uh, but contrawise blessing, uh, knowing that ye are thereunto called, uh, that you should inherit a blessing. Uh, he is telling us that we have been called uh, to inherit a blessing. Uh, you're going to face trials, uh, but the trial is not the end. Uh, the blessing is the end. Uh, the the, the uh, persecution uh, is not the end. The problem that you uh, are facing now or that you will face. Uh, understand something. That is not the end. Uh, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, I have prepared a place for you uh, that those that endure until the end, uh, the same shall be uh, saved. Uh, so we don't have to, to under, go through uh, hard times and struggles uh, with a negative approach, uh, with, with a, uh, a pessimistic approach, meaning uh, that, that every being uh, Debbie Downers or, or being uh, what, what, however you put that there, that to, to put it there that we're just down and out and discouraged and broken uh, and woe is me.
me and how bad I've got it uh, and it's only going to get worse and then you find yourself uh, slumping more and more and more. Peter said, understand something. Uh, in life there's peaks uh, and there's valleys. Uh, there's good times uh, and there's bad times. Uh, somebody looked at me the other day and said, hey sir, how you doing? You having a good day? Uh, I said, I sure am. Every day's a good day. Some are just better than others. Uh, and so when we have that approach, uh, there's those that will tell you, man, that there is not a good day in sight. Uh, and they think, man, it's a bad day. Uh, and when you have a bad day, it's bad enough as it is that it's a bad day, but it's worse when you let your attitude get in harmony with the day, isn't it? And so what Peter was challenging them said, bad days are coming. Bad days are coming. Struggles are coming. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be tightness. There's going to be struggle. But he said, be of good cheer. I, I love this. Jesus said this. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Uh, so Peter tells us some things here that we can do uh, in preparation and preparing for the best even in trying times. The first thing he told us uh, is that we need to cultivate uh, Christian love uh, or to live in peace. Uh, I had no idea what the Sunday school lesson was about. I, I glanced uh, at the page this morning because I was going to put the scriptures uh, up on the screen there for Brother Kevin because I was back there uh, uh, taking the media and doing that and preparing for all of that. So I was just going to put the, the the verses up there, but I said, man, that's too many to put up there. Uh, so I closed it up. I didn't realize uh, that y'all talked about God's love in Sunday school this morning and, the, and that love. But he tells us here, cultivate Christian love uh, or to, for us, uh, in other words, live in peace. Uh, and, and he starts off here in verse 8 with the word finally. Finally. And this word here that he puts here is he's trying to make a point. He's, all of this that he's wrote up to this point, all of this walking in humility and understanding that you're strangers and pilgrims, and we've talked about the, the difference between those things and understanding how we need to be humble and how we need to be submissive. And he's winding up and he's, he's closing out this letter, getting close to the end of this letter. Two more chapters to go, but he's, he's entering this section of his letter to him about uh, being submissive and getting to, to the end of that. He says finally. Uh, and what he's saying here is the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, he's what, saying this is very important. Uh, when, when we, he's, what he's saying uh, is what I say sometimes when I preach. And if you didn't listen to anything else I said, listen to this. That, that's what Peter is saying here. Finally. Finally. Listen. Here's what I'm really saying is what he's, he's writing to him. He's saying, this is the sum of everything that I've been trying to say. Just as the law is to, to sum up in one word, and that one word is love, uh, so the whole of our Christian life is summed up in that same word, love. So here it is. He, he said, finally, uh, be ye all of one mind, having compassion, uh, one for, of another, uh, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Uh, our love should begin uh, with a love for God's people. Uh, we should love our brothers and our sisters in the Lord. Uh, we should love one another. We should pray for one another. We should uh, care for one another. Uh, we, he tells us earlier on in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, uh, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit uh, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Uh, see that you love one another uh, with a pure heart. Get this now, fervently. Fervently. That means that we don't just love. We don't just throw the word out there, love. I close every service with telling you I love you, and that's not just throwing it out there to have something to say to end the service. But he said, do that fervently. What does it mean to love fervently? It means more than saying it. It means showing it. It means showing it, expressing it. And, and Peter said, if you're going to make it in tough times and persecutions and trials, uh, you're going to need one another. Right? Solomon said two is better than one, and a three-fold cord is not easily broken. 
The Lord even said where two or three are gathered together in his name, there will he be in the midst. Uh, what's he saying? We don't need to walk alone. Uh, can I tell somebody this morning, no man's an island. Uh, don't try to isolate yourself. Don't try to pull yourself away and cut yourself away from the body of Christ. Uh, I understand that even Jesus pulled away for times of prayer and reflection. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but when we begin to pull ourselves away from the body, pull ourselves uh, away, away from the church and uh, say, I don't need that gathering. I don't need anybody. I can make it. Uh, oh, I get it. Me and Jesus, we are the majority. Uh, but Jesus gave us a body, and that body is the church. Uh, and that's the, the uh, mechanism in which we work in. Uh, so he's saying when you go through struggle, uh, you don't need to be by yourself when you're struggling. You need somebody. And so you need somebody that's going to love you and that you can love them. And he said, do it fervently. We should love one another with a pure heart. We should love one another with that fervency he's talking about. Now, that's not always easy. That's a struggle. As a matter of fact, sometimes a tall order for some folks because people are very different. People have different personalities, different makeups, different lifestyles, different backgrounds. And we have all these differences about us. And the problem in our society today is we've got this idea because I don't agree with your ideas, I don't love you. That's messed up. Can I tell you that we're to love everybody? Everybody. I may not like it that they dye their hair purple, but I still love them. I may not like it that they've got piercings in every uh, place that they possibly can or, or you can't uh, even see their skin because of the tattoos uh, on their body. I, I don't agree with that. I believe that it's not biblical to do any of those things, uh, but it does not matter. I, I still love them. Uh, and so he's what he's telling us here uh, is that we need to love uh, those that are different. But you know what he said, especially those that are in the household of faith. Uh, now, I've talked about those uh, that are out there in the world that do crazy stuff uh, but how many know there's people in the household of faith that do crazy stuff yeah. amen they, they, they do some things that i don't i don't agree with that i don't what, why do they like that how, how can how can they like that they come over here and say uh, uh, come i come to sister gilda's house and i say sister gilda you got any sweet tea say, well, i don't drink sweet tea around here just unsweet and i'll be like, what's wrong with her that don't mean I don't love her. But I think she loves me enough that she'd go in there and make me some sweet tea. So we have these differences, and we, we don't all see eye to eye. We don't all uh, ha have the same uh, opinions about everything. Uh, so it makes it hard sometimes maybe to love people. Uh, so how can people from all walks of lives uh, with all kinds of different per per uh, backgrounds and personalities uh, come together and be closer uh, than earthly brothers and sisters? That's always amazed me that we can be uh, raised in a home and around people uh, and, and then we grow up and we go in different directions uh, and then God puts us uh, in church uh, and we come to church uh, and we've got all these different backgrounds. Uh, this one's from that side to track and that one's from that side to track. Uh, this one's from over here and that one's from over there. Uh, but we've come together uh, in one thing and that is the body of Christ. Uh, and it does not matter where you came from. It does not matter what you look like. It does not matter what you've been through. And no matter if you was born with a silver spoon in your mouth or a Dixie spoon. It does not matter where you have been. No matter if you drunk out of a china cabinet or red solo cups and paper plates. It does not matter. I went to a restaurant the other day. I said, man, they're saving a lot of money because they come around and they just dip your food, ask you, do you want some of this? And I'm like, sure. And I didn't know what to do next because there wasn't a plate but the person that was with me had been there before they just put a napkin on the table they just put the food on top of the napkin uh, maybe you didn't have plates uh, and maybe you had the best of china but that does not matter when we come together as the family of god uh, we're agreeing on one thing uh, that he is lord uh, he is my god he is my rock uh, he is my salvation uh, he's my heavenly father uh, and so if you're born again you're my brother uh, if you're born again you're my sister uh, we're brothers and sisters in christ uh, we are the body of christ uh, and members in particular 
particular. Uh, and we may not agree on everything, uh, but can I tell you, uh, we've got to love one another. Uh, we've got to help each other make it. Uh, we've got to help each other come along. Uh, we need to celebrate each other's victories uh, and not tear one another down, uh, but build one another up. Uh, and Peter said, if you're going to make it uh, through tough times, uh, the enemy's coming against your church. Uh, and if you're going to make it, uh, you're going to need your brother and your sister. Uh, don't let differences separate you, uh, but come together in agreement on the fact uh, that we're in this thing together. So how can we do that? He gives us answers in our text. There are six things that we must do. If we do these things, he ensures that we will have that close and loving relationship that God wants us to have with each other. First thing he told us to do is be of one mind. That word there really means to be like-minded. How can we be like-minded when we come from so many different thought patterns? We've got to start with this. Let this mind be in you also, which was in Christ Jesus. So we've got to be like-minded. It does not mean that we're all in uniform. Don't mean that we, we came in and, and we're in that conformity all the same. We didn't all dress the same today. We don't all have on the, the, the same uniform today. But that's not what it means. But it means cooperation in the midst of our diversities. Because there's a lot of diversity even in this room today. But and through that, there's a conformity that takes place. There's a like-mindedness that takes place. Think about the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell. Why did the Holy Ghost fall? It was not because they were in one accord in that upper room. No, it was because they were all with one accord in that upper room. They gathered there. And what does that mean? They were all like-minded. They had one goal in mind, and that was the promise of the Father. So the members of the body, they work together in unity. Uh, it always amazes me that great work that went uh, on in Nehemiah's day when they rebuilt that wall. Uh, was it because Nehemiah had a great mind and he was a, a great governor and a great leader? That had something to do with it. Uh, but it says that the wall was finished. Uh, I believe it's Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6. I believe is where it says this, uh, that the wall was completed uh, because the people had a mind to work uh, because the people uh, took responsibility uh, and went to work and what was uh, their mindset to do we've got to complete this wall we've got to get this wall completed uh, and so they all did that together and worked together uh, members of the body working together through unity through their differences uh, we may differ on how things are to be done uh, but we must agree on what must be done uh, and why it must be done uh, a man once criticized E.O. Moody uh, for his methods of evangelism and he said to Mr. Moody, he said this, uh, well, Mr., uh, or he came to Mr. Moody and told him that he had disagreed with his methods, and Mr. Moody said this, well, I'm always ready for improvement. What are your methods? The man looked back at him, and he confessed to him that he had none. Mr. Moody said, I'll stick with my own. Mr., I believe it was D.L. Moody that also said another time this, he said, I like my way of doing things better than your way of not doing things. So there, there may be differences, but what are we doing? What are the methods, he's asking? And, and understand something, uh, that if we're going to get anything done, uh, we have to do something. To understand that if we're going to, uh, uh, one man said, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step that we've got to be progressing, that we have to be doing something, uh, and that we need to be doing it together and have that mindset. So we need to work, uh, and we need to work together uh, with the same desire to please God uh, and do what has called us to do. Uh, and if you don't have a method, uh, join in with somebody that does have a method. Uh, but if you have a method, uh, and they may have a different method, uh, but it's accomplishing the same mindset and the same goal, uh, put your method together with that method uh, and do a work for the Lord. Uh, understand something. We've got to be doing something. We can't sit on the sidelines. Uh, we need to work, and we need to work together, uh, and we need to come together uh, and be of one mind. Number two, uh, in doing that, we've got to have compassion on each other. 
That, that word there, compassion, uh, comes, uh, and you begin to look at it uh, and begin to dissect it, it comes down to a word that we know as sympathy. Uh, and that literally means uh, to suffer with. Uh, so to have compassion with somebody uh, or to suffer with somebody, uh, it means that we've got to be affected by uh, what they're going through, good or bad. Uh, it, what He said uh, that we need to have compassion and be moved with compassion uh, by the needs of others. And, and be, it said that Jesus looked at the crowd and saw there was without a pastor, uh, and, and he said he had compassion on them. Uh, what does that mean? He had compassion on them. Uh, it was just as he was suffering with them. Uh, he was affected by what they were affected by. Uh, we need to get to the place that we're not, well, that's their problem. We've got to get out of that mindset. Not my problem. But a person that has compassion on someone and sees someone going through it, and they're already, those wheels are already turning of try to, try to help. Understand, you can't help somebody that don't want help. But if you see somebody who is really struggling and they're, they're trying to get through it, those, those wheels need to be turning. You need to take that to heart and, and say, God, give me a heart of compassion. Let me be affected. Let me be, be there that I, I feel. You know, we look at somebody and we say, I feel your pain. Sometimes that just becomes a statement. Do we really feel their pain? I, I will never look at somebody and tell them, I know what you're going through if I've never been through it. I'll tell them, I'm praying for you. I, I'll, I'll tell them, I, I, I can't imagine but I would never tell somebody, I know what you're going through. Maybe that's why the Lord's let me go through just about everything. <laughs> so I can look at you and say, I know what you're going through. But we, we can't look at somebody and, and say, man, I, I get it when we don't get it. But we can suffer with them. And we can see the effects of it. Why? Because if they hurt, we hurt. We should be affected by what happens to our brothers and sisters, and we should sympathize with them. Maybe we don't understand what it is. Maybe you cannot begin to fathom what they're going through, but you can sympathize with them. You can uh, understand that, that there is uh, that, that struggle that they're going through. Don't get me wrong now. We don't need to, to find somebody that's in the mully grubs that's got themselves real low and just go down and sit there with them and sit in the mully grubs with them. No, we need to be giving them a, a hand up. We need to be giving them an opportunity. He said to those that are stronger in the Lord to help those that are weaker. And so we, we have to do that through, through compassion, to having that compassion one for another. And so what Paul tells us here in, in Romans 12, 15, he tells us rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So if we rejoice, if they rejoice, we rejoice. If they weep, we weep. Now, yesterday when the, all of these folks got put in jail, they had to give a scripture that got out. I don't know how many times they heard the Bible, one of the Bible's shortest verses, Jesus wept. But Jesus wept. Why did Jesus wept? Why did he weep? We know that he called Lazarus forth out of the grave, but before he called Lazarus forth out of the grave, Lazarus was dead. He had been there. He had encountered his sisters. This was his friends. They were weeping. Uh, all the family was weeping. Uh, and though Jesus knew what was going to happen, he knew that he was going to be alive again, yet Jesus wept because he was moved. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And so though we know God can turn this thing around, Though we know it's not going to always be like this, though we know that their situation is not going to always be the same, we see how it's affected them, and we weep. It breaks our heart. We see our loved ones and our, our brothers and our sisters going through things. Our heart begins to get heavy for them, so we weep with them. And when they rejoice, we rejoice with them. Number three, have brotherly love. We are to love one another like we're blood brothers. Anybody ever do that as kids? Blood brothers, or with a brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia is called just that, the city of brotherly love, and because it comes from that Greek word, Philadelphia. And so that, that word there it, it interprets into our English word, Philadelphia. The, the word here means that we should love one another, and it's saying that we should love them as we would our own flesh and blood. So if we'll be honest with, it, with each other, we could say we're closer to our church family 
than we are a lot of our real blood family. I see you a lot more than I do some of my other family. I'm in contact with you a lot more than I am my other family. Why? Because they've got different thoughts, different views, different desires, different ambitions. They don't have this mindset that we was talking about, number one, that this mindset of serving God, living for God. Now, I've got some family that professes to be Christian, but they don't have the same mindset that I have. They don't have this, that, this mindset of being sold out, being committed, being, being everything. They, they probably think I'm fanatical and I'm overboard and, and all of those things. But I'm glad to know that God puts a family of God in our life uh, that has that same goal and that same desire. So what we're seeing here uh, is that we've come together and we begin to have brotherly love one for another because we've got something in common. We've got the same goal. Uh, we're, we're strangers and pilgrims. We understand something. Uh, this is a strange land to us that we don't belong here and we're just pilgrims passing through that we've got a home prepared we've got the others that we know that are putting up tent stakes and saying this world looks good to me I'm staying here but that's not us we can't walk in agreement with that but we have this desire of making it home so we begin to love each other with that brotherly love number four he said we've got to have pity have pity on one another he said to be pitiful that's what he said there in our text, be pitiful. That literally means to be tenderhearted. If we're not careful, we'll allow ourselves to become cold and callous. God doesn't want us to be that way. If we're not careful, our heart will be hard and we will not be moved by anybody's problems. What's wrong with them? They need to pull it together. But he said, be pitiful, be tenderhearted. Maybe you can go through that and it not affect you, but it's obviously hit them hard. And so we have to understand that we, we have to have a tender heart towards that. He wants us to, to be tender hearted to those, be pit, to have pity on those around us. With, with all the guns and the violence and the violent video games and TV shows, it's caused us to become desensitized to what's going on around us. We, we set our kids in front of a video game where they're stealing cars, and shooting people. And they say, well, it's just the game. It's just the video game. And there's blood and there's killing and there's all of that that's happening. I understand that that's society around us. I know all of that's going on. But we have all of this. All of that was put there. The devil is sly and cunning and sneaky. And he puts those things in there to desensitize, starting with the kids all the way up, uh, to desensitize us to violence, to desensitize us uh, to, to the things that's going on uh, around us and the hurt and the pain uh, that people are going through. Uh, so, so we have to be very careful of those things. We don't want anything uh, to get us in a place that we're not tender-hearted, uh, that we don't have a tender heart towards the needs of others. God wants us uh, to have that tender heart. Uh, he wants us to, to have that pity on those uh, who are not fortunate as we are uh, and, and maybe can't take the things that you can take. Maybe they haven't uh, gone through what you've gone through to, to make you strong. Maybe they haven't studied the Word of God like they needed to, uh, to understand that God's got this. Uh, we don't know where people's come from. We don't know uh, uh, people's background. Uh, too many times uh, we, we approach uh, the pulpit, Brother Underwood, and we have this cookie-cutter sheet of how everybody is supposed to, to do and work and live. Uh, I understand that, that we've got to, to live this Christian walk and that we've, there's there's a place that we've got to uh, get to and a place that we've got to obtain. Uh, but can I tell you, in this Christian race, and this Christian walk, uh, there's some that is up here and there's some that are back here. There, there's some that has progressed well and there's some that just don't get it yet. Uh, and there's some that's just started walking in this thing. Uh, so we, we have that uh, all over the spectrum, all over the scale. Uh, and, and people uh, oftentimes, we've talked about staying in your own lane, oftentimes people sit in the congregation and say, well, if I was the pastor, I would do this. If I was the pastor, I, I'd tell them this. If I was the pastor, I, I would handle that differently. Uh, but understand something, uh, that as a pastor, uh, we have have one that's here and one that's here and one that's here uh, and one that's here uh, and we're trying to get them all here uh, so we have to work with each one uh, so it's not an across the board thing uh, you know, understand that you've got to be tender hearted uh, there's times that I say they should be further along than this but I'm glad they're just still moving I'm glad that they didn't give up 
I'm glad they didn't throw in the towel. I'm glad that they're still coming. I'm glad that they're not out there in a bar room, that they didn't turn to a needle in their arm or say, I'll just go get me a six-pack and drown my troubles away. But they're still trying to make progress. They're still coming to the pastor for instruction. They're still saying, pray for me. I'm struggling. I'm thankful to hear when people say I'm struggling because you know what it means when you're struggling? You're trying. It's when you stop struggling that you got to be concerned. Uh, so if you see somebody struggling, uh, don't kick them in the hind end and say kick it in gear, uh, but get there beside them and be tenderhearted with them uh, and say thank God you're struggling because you're still in the race. Uh, you're still moving. You're still going forward. I've shared this with you before, I'm sure, but years ago uh, I was watching uh, this video it was a music video. My brother-in-law was watching it. I just happened to, to see it and walk, walk in on it. And I, and, and I don't know what it is, but it's, I, I had a neighbor that lived behind me when I was a teenager, and uh, he had Down syndrome. He was, just, he was just so fun, just fun guy, funny guy, loving guy. And I've just always loved people with Down syndrome. Their heart is just... Uh, Amy said, Amy, when Amy sees somebody with Down syndrome, she knows I'm like a magnet to them. I can't get my eyes off of them. I'm watching them uh, because of just the way they, they love and they treat. I don't know if it's part of the disease or what, but they just, everyone I've ever met, I've never met a mean person with Down syndrome that I know of. You may have, but I never have. But in this particular video, it was Special Olympics, and it was several people with Down syndrome and they were running in this Special Olympic race. There was about five or six of them and, and they were running with everything they had. Brother Under, you, you would have definitely outran them. Even now, you would have outran them. Brother Under was a runner for those that didn't know it. But even now, in his 80s, he could have outran them. They were not running very fast. But, but they were going and, and, and they were heading out and, and there was gaps between them because they were running different pace. I, I don't know how they knew it, but one of the runners fell. And all of those that had the lead somehow knew that that runner fell. So did they run to cross the finish line and say, man, I beat him? Every one of them stopped, went back, gathered around that one that fell, picked him up, they locked arms together with him, and they all went and crossed the finish line together. It may mean that you lose some ground in what you're trying to accomplish. It may, may mean you have to stop what you're doing it may mean you have to hit the pause button on what's going on in your life, but it's worth it to be tenderhearted to somebody else. So many times, we're so busy, aren't we? We've got so many, so many things going on, but we need to have such love for somebody that we've got all of this going on. How, how many times have we been busy going down the street and we see somebody broke down? We know that's a dangerous thing anymore. We don't know if it's a setup or whatever, but God smokes our heart to help somebody. Or maybe you see somebody you know that's there, and you say, man, I ain't got time for this. If I'm going down the road and I see Sister Mary Stone got a flat tire on the side of the road and my, my life is busy and I'm not praying the Lord keep all of her tires inflated in Jesus' name. But we're going down the road and I see her and I'm saying, I know her. I love Sister Mary, but I ain't got time to stop. I, I've got to get over here. I've got this call, and, I, and, and there's a family waiting for me at the hospital, and their, their, their loved one is going through this. Uh, but, but then, uh, uh, or my, my wife's got dinner on the table or whatever it is. Uh, I, I've got to go and schedule. Uh, but what's the right thing to do? Stop. Sometimes, I know that's a silly scenario, but that's, that's the busyness of our lives, and we get so focused on self and so tunnel vision uh, that we miss uh, the hurt and the struggle. Uh, but we've got to have that pity and that love uh, one for another that we can hit the pause button on our life uh, and understand whatever uh, you're going through, you're still going to be going through it. Uh, so just go and try to help somebody else. Number five, be courteous. This word courteous literally means to be humble-minded. He's telling us that as God's people, we should walk in lowliness and humbleness of mind. We shouldn't be haughty or arrogant. We should not have a know-it-all attitude. Can't tell me nothing. I already know it all. Can't teach me anything. Have you ever met those kind of people? I just you just say, okay, I tried. I tried. 
we have to understand that God has placed people in our life for a purpose that we can learn from, grow from, especially those who are versed in the Word of God. The younger can learn from the older, and that's not always means that they're older than you. It means that they're developed in the Word of God, and they've, they're, they're older than you in the, in the Lord, and they've, they know what the Word of God says, and, and, and we, we think that we know, but uh, we, we have this arrogant know-it-all attitude. I, I don't need anybody to tell me anything. He said we can't be that. We've got to have a teachable spirit. Uh, I've said it time and time again, before we can ever teach somebody, we've got to be a student. Uh, we need to continually be a student. I shared this Wednesday night, uh, that we need to continually be a student of the Word of God ever learning, uh, ever there ready, having that teachable spirit uh, that we can learn uh, and learn from one another. Uh, in, in Paul's time, the Roman, in the time of the Roman Empire there in Peter's day, uh, that was not a quality that was admired. Humility was not admired by the Romans. Uh, they thought if somebody was humble, they were considered cowardly or weak. That's not how God looks at it. Matter of fact, Jesus said, unless we're willing to humble ourselves and become as little children, we can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Humble yourself. Peter later writes and tells us, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. Humble yourself. Sometimes we've got to, we can look at others and we can tell them, man, you need to humble yourself. But when's the last time we looked at, in the mirror and said, you need to humble yourself? You know what I found out? Brother Charlie, if I don't humble myself, God has a way of humbling me. <laughs> Amen. Anybody ever been humbled by God? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but I have. And I didn't like it. But I like the end result of it because that makes you tenderhearted. It makes you realize I don't know it all. I don't have it all together. I've been humbled by Daddy before. <laughs> I've been humbled by Mama before. Mama had a little humbling mechanism she used. It was called a switch. And I've come to determination that my mom did not know legs from a butt. It was all up and down. She said, we're going round and round. She was, that was her humbling. God has a way of humbling us. And I've been there, and I don't want to be there again, so I want to be humble. And finally, number six, do not retaliate. You don't have to have the last word. Bless those who do evil against you. He's saying here that we are, are people that when people do things against us, we really have three approaches that we can take. Number one, we can take the satanic approach. Return evil for good. I don't want to do that, so we'll mark that one off. But here's the one that we typically take, the human approach. Return evil for evil good for good what does that mean when they do me wrong I'm gonna do them wrong treat me right I'll treat you right that's not biblical that's not even the golden rule is it do unto others so many people say do unto others as they do unto you no do unto others as you would have them do unto you I don't know about you but I like to be treated right Amen. I like for people to do good by me, but I can't expect people to do good by me if I'm always ripping them off. If I'm always doing things that are wrong and to them and, and, and treating them evil. You know, that happens in a sibling relationship. One sibling wants to go around slap one of the other siblings, but when they slap them, they go run at the mom and daddy, they slap me. What did you do to them? So there, there's that retaliate. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get it. We have that human approach of, of doing good to them as long as they do good to us or doing evil, whatever they do, I'm going to do. But we need to take the divine approach. And that divine approach is uh, we can return good for evil. Peter said uh, that we should always take the divine approach. Uh, we are trying to tell them uh, that official persecution was just around the corners, what he's trying to tell them. Uh, and they should be, that they needed uh, to be prepared for it. Uh, and we understand what Peter was writing to them. But do we understand uh, that that's the same thing that is happening to us as Christians today in America? The same thing is true for us. Persecution's just around the corner. 
We have not known persecution up to this point. We think. We think that we know it. We think because they told us uh, you can't pray in school or you can't carry your Bible here or Ten Commandments have to come down. Man, we've been persecuted. Uh, but can I tell you, as long as there's tests in schools, there'll be prayer in schools. As long as there's smartphones in school, there's Bibles in school because kids got it downloaded on their phone. I don't know about you, but I've been to many graduations over the years, and you know what they did? They prayed. So that's not persecution. That, that, that's just something for us to think, well, they told me I couldn't do it. So what? We still live in the land of the free. We can still pray if we want to. If, if I want to, I can go stand in downtown Middlebury, right in the middle of the street and pray out loud. Nobody can do anything about it. I can still do that. I can open up my Bible, and I can read the Bible right there in the middle of city square, town square, if I wanted to. We have that right. So we don't know what persecution is, but persecution is coming. And as we see that and we understand that, uh, we, we have to understand that there's people that's going to give up the fight against evil, uh, and, and they're going to give in to the wicked demands, uh, and they're going to say, well, uh, uh, I can't do it. Uh, and they're gonna be, there's persecution that comes for it. Uh, but there's going to be those that will be like Daniel uh, and say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to pray anyway. I don't care what you say. Uh, I'm standing for what is right. I'm standing for the Word of God. Uh, and, and so we're living in that time. What are you talking? about uh, there, there's laws already being put in place for what they call hate crimes now I understand there are hate crimes but what they're calling hate crimes uh, is any pastor that will stand in this pulpit uh, and preach against homosexuality. Uh, there's legislation already being put in place uh, to say if you preach against homosexuality, uh, that's a hate crime. Uh, see, that's some people that don't have a clue what they're talking about. Uh, but because I preach against the sin of homosexuality uh, does not mean I hate the homosexual. Uh, I love the homosexual enough to let them know uh, that that lifestyle is sin uh, and they can't make it to heaven with that lifestyle. Uh, just like I would the alcoholic, uh, just like I would the prostitute, uh, just like I would the gossip. Uh, and to understand that, uh, but we're facing a time that all of this is in place uh, to say that it was going to affect us, going to try to silence Christians, uh, it's going to try to silence the pulpit, uh, it's going to try to get us into a place uh, that we cannot preach uh, or have no desire to preach against sin anymore. Uh, but God's looking for a people uh, that will stand together, uh, that will stand for sure and stand strong and to understand where we've got to stand with God and to go against the, the, the stream of what is happening and to know that if we don't, if we're against that, if we're against preaching the truth, we're going to be in trouble. We're not going to be liked. We're not going to be tolerated. So what are we supposed to do? This is the persecution he's talking about that's coming. As you see the day approaching is what he said in Hebrews, gather together more. But it seems like we see the day approaching, we gather together less. God knew what he was talking about when he wrote the word of God. But it seems like we go in the totally opposite direction. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to have to beg God to help us to love those? oppose us we're going to have to pray in essence that's begging God pleading with God need some old fashioned seekers pray all night long need some people with prayer lives that are bind together in unity can I, can I tell you like I told you earlier two is better than one but a three fold cord is not easily broken man when we come together and agree together in prayer when we have all of these divisions, when we have those that are supposed to be promoting and sharing the gospel can't even take a stand against sin, we're in trouble. People that's been known as Christian artists denouncing their faith, people that stand in pulpits that are in the limelight and got the camera on them, man, I wish I could get the platform that they had. The, man, what an opportunity they have to use that platform to share the gospel. And they ask them, sinners, Larry King, Oprah Winfrey, 
have them on their show and look at them and just ask them straight up questions about sin. And they put it in a gray area. They take and narrow it down. Church, we're not going to make it through persecution if we cower down like that. But we have to stand for the Word of God. And we've got to take and understand it's not about retaliating. He said he'll fight all of our battles, but standing for what is right. To stand for what is right. To let them know this is what we believe and this is what we stand for. And we should not be leaving anybody standing there alone. Saddest picture I guess I've ever seen is gathering at the flagpole for prayer. One student. One student standing there. It's a sad but a happy picture at the same time. I said, thank God for that young person. He says, no matter if anybody else is going to pray, I'm going to pray. But I'm also thinking, where's the others? Where's the others? We can't stand alone. We've got to fight. He said, if my people, not if my person, if my people. Elijah thought he was the only one. He said, no, I've got several that have not bowed a knee. If you've not bowed a knee to bow, bind together in agreement with those who have not. Look for those that still stand. Peter was telling us and giving us good reasons to love our enemies that we should inherit a blessing. So if we're going to, to get there, it's going to take God. and We need God's help to do that. And he ended there in verse 9 that we should inherit a blessing. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking that city whose builder and maker is God not living for fame social status or any of that he said I go to prepare a place for you we're pilgrims strangers and pilgrims passing through we're going to be persecuted for that we're going to face struggle and hardship and conflict because of that we have got to align together with people of faith Gotta be very careful, very careful who you're lining up with. I, I've thought about this many times. We've got to be very careful what fountain we're drinking out of. Amen? Where we're getting our information, what, what, we're, what we're taking in, that's a whole message in itself. But we've got to gather together. Why? Because we're preparing for the best, even when it's going to get worse. Even when we're going to come under attack, we're preparing the best. And if we're going to make it through that time, we must treat others right. Because that's going to determine whether we inherit a blessing or not. Heard this statement made. I think uh, Brother Corey shared it at camp meeting I was at this week. said it was a quote from Brother Hanks from years ago. First thing you ever heard him preach. said, if we're going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, you're going to first have to do well. You're first going to have to do well. I want to hear well done. And where does that well done come from? By the way we treat others. By the way that we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, we're going to face persecution. The world's going to come against us. We're going to be hated. We're going to be all of those things. But we must treat others with that love that God has treated us with. Will you stand with me this morning? Father, there's a lot that goes in to determine whether we inherit a blessing or not. We all want a blessing. We all want to live a blessed life. We all want to enter into that place that you've prepared for us. We all want to know when this life is over that we'll step into that place that you prepared for us. But in order to receive that, God, we've got to prepare ourselves for the best. And in preparing ourselves for the best, as a direct reflection on how we treat others, especially those of the household of faith. I pray God bind us together with love, tenderheartedness, comforting one another, helping one another, strengthening one another, iron sharpening iron. Pray God that you'd help us to, to learn from one another, grow one with another, help one another make it. And I pray, Father God, if there's any of those areas which we're lacking that we will... Leave it at the altar this morning that we may become what you'd have us to be.
do what you'd have us to do, fulfill what you'd have us to fulfill. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you gather with me around these altars this morning? And let's just pray, God, if there's any of these areas, maybe maybe you can look at those those bullets, the six things that I went over and said, I really need to pray about that. I need to really pray about that area of my life. And as you see that and you reflect and do some search, searching, be of one mind, have compassion, brotherly love, pity, being courteous, no need to retaliate, but bless those who do evil against you, standing for what is right. If you lack in any of those areas, he, he'll give freely. So let's pray this morning and ask God to touch us.